Yeah, John, welcome to our university in Regensburg. We've been working together in the uh, German Advisory Council on Global Change for many years in Berlin. I'm a professor here for Renewable Energies and Energy Storage. You've been at many UN conferences and today you're back at home at your home university. 50 years ago you were one among the first physicist students and mm -hmm. uh, we've got a great Friday's movement starting with Greta Thunberg, whom you met also personally. We at the Scientists for Future, we, we support them very much. And today you, you've got the EU Climate Emergency Declaration in Brussels and you've published the Urgent Nature paper and there was another paper in nature two years ago a much common paper on the uh, tipping points the paper was called three years to safeguard mm. our climate mm. uh, where you wrote and i quote should emissions continue to rise beyond 2020 or even remain level the temperature uh, goals set in paris become almost unattainable mm. so now we are at the end of 2019 global emissions still rise and st still doesn't seem that they will sink from 20, uh, 2021 mm. on mm. so how long can we as scientists actually seriously say that the Paris goal are still achievable, practicable, and not just theoretical? Because that's uh, in concrete terms, because yeah, it's, it cannot be that everything is lost. And where is the motivation to find, uh, to reduce the CO2 emissions as much as yeah. possible behind this? No, on the, the on the one hand, I also once said it's worth fighting for every tenth yes. of a degree. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Because even if we would overshoot the two degrees line uh, then uh, still we could avoid even worse impacts if we would uh, actually try to stop global warming at 2.3 instead of four or five yeah. or six or eight but even degrees, if we have uh, the domino effect of tipping point. Uh, uh, yeah. that is the question is is, is is of course still with the jury the scientific jury i mean there are two ways uh, you can approach this. On the one hand, the IPCC did a special report on the Paris Agreement, uh, which was solicited by the United Nations. And this was a very tough job, of course, because on the one hand, the IPCC more or less argued, yes, it would be very wise to stop global warming at 1.5 degrees warming, or a little bit more, absolutely, and the paper that appears or appeared in Nature today actually underpins that and corroborates that very clearly. On the other hand, the IPCC somehow had to tell the world it's still feasible to stop global warming at 1.5 degrees. Uh, and this can only be achieved, or it was only achieved by the IPCC with a huge trick, namely immense negative emissions, uh, which come from BECs or others. Even, so even geoengineering, whatever. I think this is a slightly dishonest take on the situation because nobody can really imagine how you could uh, create this huge amount of negative emissions. Mm -hmm. If you keep on emitting the next 20 years, uh, emissions still rise, CO2 is rising anyway, and then a huge machinery, uh, a global infrastructure will be established which would cost trillions uh, which would suck up the CO2 from the atmosphere again. This is not a good narrative actually. Yeah? So what we are saying is, so my colleagues like Johan Rockström, Stefan Ramstorff, Will Steffen Manafas, Tim Lenton, we are saying also today we have to bring down emissions quickly by raising just everything we have. So of course we have to get rid of the combustion engine very soon. We have to stop coal power uh, by 2030 globally at the latest. Uh, we have to move from steel and concrete to wood construction and so on. So there's an almost perfect plan how to mm. do it actually. Yeah? Plus we have to strengthen the natural carbon sinks. Instead of inventing new ones, uh, which will never happen at the global scale, uh, it would be too costly, there would be no consensus on it. Let's simply try to protect the current forests and the current marshlands, the wetlands and so on. Stop the destruction of the natural things and then convert degraded land into forests or savannas and wetlands again. Eh? And this is the natural solution. It's We call it naturally negative. And the two things complete decarbonization by 2050 plus stopping of the destruction of the natural 
ecosystems and then converting into in an expansion again. This is the two-front war we have to wage now and which we have to win, actually. It's a tall order. Nobody knows whether it's possible. But at least we tell people the truth. Unlike in the IPCC report where you have one knob you are turning that is negative emissions, yeah. however produced, and if you turn the knob far enough, then everything is fine, so to speak. I think this is not a good answer to a problem which is actually an existential threat to our civilization. We excluded this negative emissions in our some model calculations mm -hmm. for the in the German Advisory Council on Absolutely. Global Change uh, for some well reasons and in our national models we see as well if we have the carbon budget left uh, that means by 2030 we are out of fossil heating systems, oil heaters, we are out of uh, fossil engines uh, and we replace coal and so on in, in the manufacturing of steel and glass via power to X, via hydrogen, via wind mm. and solar. So this all is technically possible and doable. We've got the solutions. It's not that we do not have solutions. But as I said, the, the recent emission gap report showed us that the national goals which we have so far lead us to oh, yeah. a world of 3.2 uh, degrees. Mm. So far beyond what's necessary. So. We need mechanisms and sharper national goals. And uh, the EU has a critical role because yeah. if the EU doesn't move, China and India will not act. But uh, Germany is missing its climate goals and is one of the strongest blockers of mm. uh, sharper national climate action plans at the EU. So it's much too little that what we do. So what actions should politicians uh, in charge take now? Oh, we tell them all the time. Huh? So <laughs> face out coal maturely and so on. But I think... That is not uh, the right answer. It's, it's a reasonable answer, but the real answer is a different one. I mean, of course, it seems that our chances to deliver on Paris are very slim. I personally don't think we can stop global warming at 1.5 degrees, but I still think we can stop short of 2 degrees, which might create a number of risks, but it would avoid the worst at least. Yeah. Yeah, so let's uh, first of all in a realistic way try to stop global warming at two degrees. If we can do even better, wonderful, yeah, of course. I think ordinary uh, business as usual politics is of course too slow on the one hand. So of course now in Madrid people will deplore the state of the world and then pledges will be made for the next conference. I've been at most of his conferences. It's very depressing, of course, yeah. Yeah? and nothing gets, uh, gets done. But I introduced this concept of tipping points in the Earth system into the scientific debate a long time ago. And we are just currently publishing another paper about social tipping points. Yeah? So you can only fight non-linearity with non-linearity. That's the idea. Yeah? So if there are physical and biological non-linearities, which are very threatening uh, and which are very scary. Humanity can strike back with nonlinearity as well. That means you can create processes which are all exponential, infectious, whatever. Uh, and I think the encyclical Laudato Si, the turning around of the Catholic Church in this debate, mm -hmm. the phenomenon of Greta Thunberg, uh, who rose from nothing like Jeanne d'Arc did in the 14th century, uh, you see, we actually try to identify a, a whole number of social tipping points where once you start a certain process, when it grows by feedbacks in an exponential way, divestment movement, for right. example, uh, which was starting somewhere at Californian universities, and now divestment is growing, and even the Sovereign Wealth Fund of Norway has decided to get out of fossil investment and others will follow. So we can only set our hope on these nonlinear or even exponential dynamics which we can create within the social body that is within our society. So I think uh, not all is lost yet. There is hope. But the gradualism, uh, the incrementalism, the way economists calculate, uh, you are always close to equilibrium, you do a little bit of improvement here or there, cost effective, least cost optimized. We cannot optimize ourselves out of the climate crisis. There will be disruptive things, there will be disruptive processes, but this will be 
positive disruptive processes. So as a complex system scientist, I really bet and I rely on the non-linearities. Mm -hmm. As a scientist, we also have a double role. We create science and uh, knowledge, but we also are part of the society. So as, as you said, the Fridays movement can really help. And your colleague, Bert Weiger, from the uh, environmental organization Bund Naturschutz, he said, if Fridays for Future had started half a year earlier, we would have different uh, phase-out times for coal power. So, uh, as you said, the Coal Commission is not really on right track so far to implement it. But we, as scientists, we always have also to deal with climate skeptics. You know, casual people say, okay, um, this will pass by, also this Fridays movement. And for us as scientists, it's important to know uh, how can we as scientists influence change? What more uh, can we do apart from reducing the ecological footprint, of sciences and inform people about the facts, what's the potential in scientists of future? Could we really make an influence and uh, start this change process on, an, on a different level? You know, what, what, what's your message also to the people who are climate skeptics and what can we do? Yeah, I have, kind of have given up to argue with climate okay. skeptics yeah. uh, because you yeah. may know that in the US there's still the Flat Earth Society. Yes. Yes. And if you do a poll, uh, your public opinion, when 2% of the Americans think, yes, the Earth is flat, but even worse, I think more than 20% say, I don't know whether it's a sphere or, 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 or a disk on mm -hmm. the Earth. Or. So this is very yeah. scary, and I think 50% of the Germans still believe in horoscopes. Eh? Right. So you cannot argue with that. You have to convince a minority, but an educated and active, mm -hmm. uh, enthusiastic uh, and innovative minority, and the others will follow in the end. Uh, and for this West, is better than to convince. Yeah, the vital few, as it was put many times. Uh, mm -hmm. And what we learn from complex systems, if you can convince, say, 15 to 20 percent of the actors in a system, this will already bring the change, which is will already tip the system into a new mode of operation. Because most of the people are not interested, say, I don't understand, whatever you do, I will somehow accommodate myself. Uh, but what is important, uh, because you asked about the role of the scientist, I think the scientist in particular in Germany, for well understandable reasons, because during the Nazi time, uh, science was really corrupted uh, and supported the system. Most right. of the people, uh, the Jewish colleagues were expelled or even killed uh, and nobody opposed to that in, in, in a public way or not even a private way. So the German scientific system after the war has adopted this uh, almost ideology of strict objectivity. Yeah? We do the scientific results, we publish in papers nobody can read except a few colleagues, and, and that's it, that's our job. Huh? And society, please give us billions of euros, but we can play with our curiosity. This is not good enough. Huh? In times of deep crisis, scientists have to take a stance. We have to say, yes, these are our insights. We have to communicate them. Yeah. Not everybody will accept it. We will always right. be with oddball skeptics. Uh, you yeah. can never convince them of anything. So just ignore them. But many people are curious and eager to learn about the scientific evidence. But when you should go one step further as a scientist, you do, should also make recommendations to politicians or to stakeholders, uh, CEOs of big companies, whatever. Uh, so this is actually a new role, at least in German science, become party, but a party of the future, if you like. Uh. So scientists for future and Christians for future and so on. This is now the challenge. In normal times, in usual times, this would not be necessary. We could retreat to our ivory towers, which are very cozy places. Mm -hmm. But now we have to step out and yeah. Actually, I often cite also, I did that at the Pontifical Academy of Sciences, I'm citing Dante Alighieri, the greatest sort of writer in, in Italian history, uh, who once said in Divina Commedia, the famous one is that the hottest places in hell are reserved for those who in times of deep moral crisis stay strictly neutral. <laughs> That's 
beautiful because also in Italy there have been uh, scientists who have been uh, pledged by the judges because they didn't warn about earthquakes, I know, I like. you know, and that's why it's our responsibility yeah. to speak out, to communicate and to uh, get into the society, get into the discussions. The last question I have, short and short answer. What is at this point in time your most important message to mankind within one minute? The, the message is we are in deep trouble what means our action have to actually match the scope of the challenge so that means everybody has to change their lives now for the future and for humanity thank you john for this yeah. nice interview thank you. Thank you.